Okay, welcome everybody to today's webinar, which is Sustainable Soil Remediation, Seeking Alternatives, which will be presented by Stephanie Nichols. So the, this webinar is the second uh, edition of our Sustainable Soil Remediation series, which opened earlier on um, last month with a presentation from Jonathan Atkinson from the Environment Agency, which can be found on our YouTube channel. So today it's a real pleasure to be joined by Stephanie, who is currently a principal consultant at TRC Companies Limited, based in London. She's a contaminated land specialist with over 13 years experience and has spent a large part of her career working for developers, assisting clients through the planning process and working on the US Air Force bases in East Anglia, carrying out various site investigations and remediation projects. So she's got a wealth of experience that she can bring into today's presentation. So today Stephanie is going to examine the dig and dump process to explore the wider environmental impacts of this type of methodology and, and examine possible more, more sustainable alternatives. So as always, there will be a chance for questions at the end of Stephanie's presentation. So do submit these in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any point during her presentation. So you should see that in the bottom bar of your screen in Zoom. I will then ask these on your behalf um, and Stephanie, Stephanie and I will have a conversation at the end. So thank you all for logging in and I'll now hand over to Stephanie. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, apologies for slight technical issues. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining me um, uh, this afternoon. Uh, my presentation, as uh, Rihanna had mentioned, is going to be on sustainable soil re remediation, and I'll be looking to delve into the background of the traditional dig and dump method, why it's been a prepared preferred method for many years, its negative impacts, and how we as consultants and remediation contractors could look into more innovative methods of remediation that can effectively remediate the site whilst having minimal environmental, social and economic impacts. Uh, I would like to just stress that the purpose of this presentation is to promote discussion on more sustainable remediation options, and it's not about what uh, the right and wrong way to remediate contaminated land. Um, everyone has their own opinion. Um, every site is different. So this is just a, a, a way to just discuss um, what, what we should potentially consider when looking at remediation. Uh, so just a quick uh, rundown of what I'm going to be presenting. Um, I'm just going to start with a brief introduction into remediation, the reasons for it, and I'll then provide a background on dig and dump and why it's been seen as the preferred method for a lot of clients. And, and then I'm going to follow that up with the trends in dig and dump. And then I'm going to talk about some of the problems um, that dig and dump has and the negative impacts um, it has on uh, the environment and then I'm finally going to talk about some alternatives we should be considering um, to replace this method of remediation and finally discuss how we can work with clients to see the benefits of moving away from dig and dump to use more innovative and sustainable methods of remediation. So we've got a history of heavy industrial use um, that has led to the re requirement for remediation in order to be able to redevelop. Um, the traditional method of remediation on sites have largely uh, involved dig, dig and dump, which can involve excavating large quantities of contaminated soils and disposing it off site at various landfills, soil treatment facilities or reclamation facilities. A lot of clients tend to opt for this um, method of remediation rather than considering other options. So I'm going to talk a bit about why clients might prefer this method. Um, dig and dump is seen as a widely available method of remediation. It's generally seen as being very straightforward and feasible on the majority of sites. It's seen as an effective and quick fix solution to contaminated land. It ensures contamination is removed from site. And one of the greatest benefits of dig and dump as seen by clients is that it allows for a shorter remediation program, which in a lot of cases is what the client wants, particularly if they are seeking to redevelop on the site and need to meet their programs. 
from my experience, having worked for a lot of developer clients, particularly in the commercial sector, they tend to have very short programs. And so this method of remediation suits them well. And as a result, they're less likely to consider any other option. Other more innovative remediation options may involve further assessment and design, which can lead to additional costs um, for the client and potentially require more time and therefore it lacks appeal. Um, there are other reasons besides environmental where you may be looking to excavate large quantities of soils for removal. And an example of this is for geotechnical purposes. Uh, there are times where a site may not have the ground conditions or geology suitable for founding on, and as a result, that may lead to its removal. Uh, this could include variable may ground or very soft layers on a site such as peat, which could which would be just deemed be deemed unsuitable for foundations. Um, clients may see the removal of this material as the most straightforward way of dealing with unsuitable ground conditions rather than consider options such as ground improvement. Um, so moving on to the trends um, scene for, for dig and dump, um, this was something that was widely used in the 1990s and early 2000s. However, the impl implementation of landfill tax in the late 1990s and its subsequent escalation, whose aim was to minimise waste disposal and to encourage alternative means dealing with waste through options such as recycling, uh, led to a decrease in this method methodology in the 2000s. Although there was landfill tax, there was also landfill tax exemption for brownfield development, which was a government incentive to encourage re remediation of brownfield land, yet in a sense promoted the use of digger dump as the means um, for remediation. Also, um, in recent times with the introduction of soil treatment facilities and reclamation facilities, there has been an uptick in excavating and removal of contaminated soil contaminated soils instead of considering other remediation options. However, there are multiple problems with the dig and dump methodology. Um, firstly, it is considered to be a very wasteful methodology um, with landfill space fast running out. And with the rise of landfill tax, um, more consultants are looking at alternative ways to remediate. Uh, go uh, government statistics show that over half the waste generated by the UK is related to construction, demolition and excavation, with the most recently available information showing that in 2016 nearly 60 million tonnes of waste soils were generated and, and soils make up to 55% of the tonnage received by landfills. Uh, so just continuing on with uh, discussing the problem with dig and dump. Um, whilst remediation, which allows for the reuse and redevelopment of previously contaminated land may be seen as sustainable practice, to get to that point will result in environmental, social and economic impacts. It is therefore important that the remediation methodology selected does not cause a greater negative impact than the contamination you are trying to remediate. There are a number of environmental, social and economic impacts associated with dig and dump. So just starting with the environmental impacts, um, you've got the haulage of soils from sites to landfill or soil treatment facilities, which will lead to increased fuel consumption, increased carbon impact, air emissions and noise pollution through the sort of trucks running up and down the roads from between the site and various facilities. Uh, the soils will likely get disposed of at a landfill, um, which isn't ideal. Um, it's likely that once you've ex excavated and removed the contamination, you will need to backfill and reinstate the excavation using clean imported materials. This again will require significant uh, haulage of material, which once again leads to increased fuel consumption, air emissions, noise pollution, carbon impact. Um, social impacts of dig and dump will include health and safety aspects such as the use of heavy plant on site, exposure to contaminants and again heavy vehicle movements on, on site. 
albeit short term, um, there could be could also be disruption to neighbours through the increased site activity, heavier traffic, dust and noise generated. Um, some of the economic impacts would include the costs of undertaking the work, so landfill tax and disposal costs, costs of mobilisation and plant use, um, the potential for import of clean aggregates if required will also be costly and the potential for dis discovering further contamination could lead to increased remediation costs as further excavation and removal of material may be required. Um, all three aspects need to be considered in any remedial design in order to achieve a sustainable outcome. Uh, a couple of other things to um, other points to consider when looking at environmental impacts of this method is that although you are removing contamination from one site, you are merely relocating the problem, not solving it, by moving the contaminated soils from one location to another location, albeit one that has more controls in place. And whilst the presence of soil treatment facilities and reclamation facilities have led to less disposal of, of contaminated soils to landfill, you still have to contend with the amount of soil haulage there will be in order to transport the material to these facilities. Uh, in an ideal situation, um, a remediation options appraisal will be undertaken to aid selection of the most appropriate method. Um, put up an example on the slide. However, please note there are other ways an appraisal can be undertaken. This is just one way of doing it. Um, a remediation options appraisal is undertaken through a tiered approach. So, Tier one, you identify the feasible remediation options for the site. Uh, this will consider the objectives and criteria set for the site. Uh, important to consider things like the site setting, practicality, accessibility of the site, current site status, stakeholder views, um, so such as regulators and site owners and neighbouring properties. You then have the second tier where you evaluate each of the shortlisted options you determine in tier one. Um, you could produce a matrix similar to the one presented here and assess each option based on a point scoring system. Uh, things to assess would include how applicable is the method, how feasible is this method on the site, how effective is this method, what are the cost implications, um, what, what are the cost management such as does this method have a large initial cost or is it a small initial cost with the cost spread over treatment duration. The duration of the remediation itself, so does it require long-term treatment and management or is it a short-term uh, solution? And finally, how sustainable is this method? Um, the final tier is to select options that will deal with the site as a whole. So it may lead to consideration of whether you can combine multiple options and if possible, the practicality of combining um, multiple options. This tier may then lead you, have to, lead you to have to reassess and revisit previous tiers. Um, as mentioned previously, remediation options appraisals do vary and no one way is correct. Um, the contaminated land sector is always looking at new ways to improve remediation practices and presently one of the things that's strongly considered when selecting uh, remediation methods is how sustainable it is. Um, unfortunately, even with a remediation options appraisal, a lot of the time clients objectives are driven by time and costs and as a result we are often left with one option and that is excavation and removal of soils from site. There are initiatives out there such as the UK Sustainability Remediation Forum which was set up in the late 2000s, um, which was developed to aid a balanced decision-making process in terms of sustainable remediation. This initiative looks to encourage the consideration of sustainability associated with potential remediation early on in the site's redevelopment process. It targets not just those who produce the remediation options appraisals or strategies, but a wide range of stakeholders, including the site owners, consultants, remediation contractors, the local community, regulators, town planners, architects. So the framework identifies um, six key 
principles. So protection of human health and the wider environment. So um, for example, should, it should remove unacceptable risks to human health and protect the wider environment now and in the future for the agreed land use and give due consideration to the costs, benefits, effectiveness, durability and technical feasibility of available options. Safe working practices, so ensuring that the works undertaken are safe for both the site workers and the wider community and should also minimise impacts to the environment. Consistent, clear and reproducible evidence-based decision-making. So decision-making on remediation methodologies should consider environmental, social and economic factors and need to consider both current and future implications. Record keeping and transparent reporting. Um, it's important that when, de when decisions are made, there are clear records kept showing the supporting data used and assumptions made, which demonstrates to interested parties that a sustainable solution has been adopted. Uh, good governance and stakeholder involvement. So it's important to consider stakeholders' views and allow them to participate, which will contribute to the decision making process and sound science. So all decisions should be made on accurate and reliable data and also based upon the best available information. So SURF UK has 15 indicators, so five social, five economic and five environmental that can be utilised for your sustainability assessment when it's undertaking a remediation options appraisal. As mentioned, it is very important where possible to engage with clients early on and inform them of things they need to consider, such as remediation when they are developing their programme. By doing this, you stand a better chance of being able to consider and select a remediation option that does consider sustainability. Um, so as mentioned uh, previously, it's important to look for other ways to remediate which strongly considers sustainability. Um, I'm now going to briefly go through some alternatives that can be considered when looking to remediate contaminated sites and talk a bit about the advantages and disadvantage, uh, disadvantages of each. Um, the first option is to determine whether there can be any design-led mitigation measures that can be adopted at the site. This might include the placement of hard standing at the proposed development. So it works well for commercial type developments where you have service yards and minimal soft landscaped areas. Um, the material could also potentially be moved to other areas of the proposed development where hard standing will be placed or below the proposed building footprints. Uh, the benefits of this would include removing the need for any off-site disposal, thus not requiring um, landfills and as a result there will be no haulage um, which will then lead to less air emissions, less fuel consumption, less noise, less dust generation. Um, this method would also lead to minimal or as mentioned would, would lead to minimal disruption to the local community and, um, and generally will be considered a safer method as there'll be a decrease in lorries entering and leaving the site. Um, there will also be less cost involved in this method as you will um, be removing any potential for disposal costs and haulage of material. However, um, when looking at design-led mitigation measures, there are things that need to be considered which include um, the fact that contamination will remain in the ground and this should be recorded for any future potential sale of the site and future, any other future redevelopment. Um, this method would also only really be suitable if there are no other receptors that would be at risk, so such as controlled waters and migration off-site to neighbouring properties. Um, so it wouldn't work on sites that have sensitive aquifers underlying it um, and, uh, yeah, and would only be sort of suitable for sites that have low permeability soils, which would limit any migration off-site. Um, also, if you are placing any um, potentially contaminated soils underneath the footprint of a building, it is important to make sure that there is no risk from vapour intrusion in the proposed building, uh, particularly if there is hydrocarbon contamination present. Um, and also it is important to consider uh, the geotechnical suitability of the material uh, that you're using uh, for foundations. 
Um, On-site treatment of soils could also be considered. Uh, examples of this would be things like land farming or windrows for hydrocarbon contaminated soils where you'll excavate the contaminated soil and place it on the ground surface, add nutrients, minerals and moisture and turning it regularly to promote microbial activity, thus aiding the degradation of um, the hydrocarbon contamination to an acceptable level before placing the soils back into the ground. Um, biopiles is another method whereby you can excavate the contaminated soils and place it in a shaped pile and aerate it using something like a vacuum pump. Um, the vapours can be treated using granulated activated carbon to reduce any emissions. Um, the, the benefits of on-site treatment of soil includes minimal requirements for extensive amounts of equipment, machinery, therefore less energy is required, so less fuel consumption, air emissions. Um, it could be perceived positively by the public as it's a method that relies on natural processes only. Um, there's no requirement for any off-site disposal, so saves on landfill use. Um, and this method um, unlike design-led mitigation, um, will, lead, will treat the contamination and hopefully break down toxic compounds to potentially non-toxic compounds. Um, things to consider with this method, though, is that the, it, it does take um, quite a bit of space and time to carry out. Um, it's not suitable for all contamination, and you may end up having to carry this out off-site, which could then again lead to haulage costs, which isn't ideal, because um, again, it could lead to more traffic, again, more air emissions, more fuel consumption. Um, the process is also highly sensitive to environmental conditions of the site. It can also potentially cause odour problems to both the site and surrounding areas, so odour control measures will need to be considered, and also it requires um, more monitoring on site, which could lead to increased costs to, to determine whether the process um, happening is happening and at what rate. And in some cases, there may be only partial degradation of the compound leading to metabolites that may still be toxic to the environment and more mobile leading to potential off-site migration. Um, Again, you can, other, uh, you can also consider other on-site treatments of soils that don't require any kind of excavation, so soils that just remain in situ. Um, so things like biosparging and air sparging. Um, so biosparging utilises microorganisms to help biodegrade contaminants. Um, air and nutrients are injected to aid the microorganism activity in breaking down hydrocarbon compounds. Um, and air sparging or soil vapor extraction involves injecting air into the soil where air bubbles are formed and travel through the contamination in and above the groundwater. Uh, these bubbles volatilize contamination and in stored vacuum extraction points extract the vapors utilizing a soil vapor extraction system. The benefits of um, in-situ soil treatments are very similar to those of ex-situ. So these include minimal requirements for extensive amounts of equipment and machinery. Um, again, it could be perceived positively by the public as it is relying on natural processes, it does not involve any kind of excavation of material, which would lead to less disruption to surrounding areas and so less dust and noise as well. Um, there's no requirement for any off-site disposals or saves on landfill use. Um, this, again, this method will actually treat the contamination and hopefully break down the toxic compounds um, to non-toxic compounds. And it, it does not require a huge amount of space. Um, and again, it's a safer process as you're not having to excavate any material out of the ground. Um, again, there are disadvantages to this method. Um, the, the amount of, um, so it, it, this method would also take a considerable amount of time. So that's um, something to consider. Plus it's not suitable for all kinds of contamination. It can also um, potentially cause odour problems to both the site and the surrounding areas. So again, you'd need to consider odour control measures. Um, 
It may require more monitoring on site again to determine whether the process is happening. So this could add more costs. And again, it's a highly, it's a method, it's a method that's highly sensitive to environmental conditions of the site. Um, so as you can see, there is no one method that has all the positives with no negatives. Uh, the, the important message here is to strike the right balance and to consider all available options before selecting the most appropriate method. As previously, as previously discussed, there are many things to consider besides the contamination itself and every site is different and presents its own challenges. Um, as mentioned earlier on in the presentation, um, there are situations where soils um, are environmentally suitable but not geotechnically suitable for foundations. So I just want to touch upon this a little bit. Um, when that occurs, you, you could have uh, soils that are perfectly fine environmentally that has to be removed and disposed of off-site um, as it's not suitable for founding on. And this would again lead to significant haulage and result in all the issues that I've previously discussed. Um, considerations should be made with regards to whether it's necessary to um, excavate and remove these soils from site. Um, could the client consider ground improvement as an option? It, it could be that the cost of ground improvement versus soil disposal would be fairly comparable. Um, however, with ground improvement, you would also need to consider um, the need to import materials to do um, the ground improvement. And again, this could lead to higher costs. And again, you'll be transporting more materials to the site, which is um, not the most sustainable way of doing things. Um, could the client consider using the material removed on other parts of the development, such as uh, in soft landscape areas if deemed environmentally, environmentally suitable? Um, this would save on both disposal and import, import costs. So it's definitely something worth considering. So um, unfortunately, uh, the majority of the time, uh, remediation methodologies selected are purely driven by time constraints and costs, which makes it difficult when trying to adopt a more sustainable remediation approach. So how best can we convince clients to consider a more sustainable approach? Um, a lot of companies have corporate social responsibilities and being seen to consider sustainability when remediating will demonstrate compliance to their policies and will benefit them by giving them positive public relations as they'll be seen as doing the right thing. I also think engaging with clients early on in the process could help them see the importance of sustainability and to best inform them on the other, of the other methods that could potentially be adopted on site that would assist them developing their programme of works and allow them to include time for remediation. If clients can see the bigger picture, they may be more open to consider more sustainable options. It is likely that clients would be more open to more sustainable options of remediation if they are provided, provide economic incentives to do so. Um, I think that's it. So thank you all for listening. Um, yeah, I hope you found it informative and yeah, if anyone has any questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Stephanie. That was really interesting. And there have been quite a few kind of comments just for discussion and questions come in. Um, but before we kick off, there's just one point of clarification that an attendee is seeking. Um, just to ask what is meant by below the footprint that you mentioned. So, so the, the building footprint, so where the building will essentially stand. Okay. Fantastic, thank you. Hopefully that answers the attendees' questions, but if you've got any more, then do let us know. Okay, I'm going to kick off with the first one. To say, is one approach to increasing the consideration of, to increase the consideration of non-dig and dump approaches to raise the weighting that sustainability gets within the remediation appraisal? Yeah, that would be something um, that could be considered because I think at the moment remediation options appraisals might not necessarily be carried out <laughs> you know from my experience a lot of the time um, you know we don't really have the time to actually do a proper remediation options appraisal due to sort of program 
limitations and I think and, and also there are times where people do not consider um, sustainability when doing their appraisals so yeah I think it's definitely something that should rank higher um, when carrying this out I mean there's like I said before there's no one correct way of doing it um, definitely think it's worth looking at the surf UK framework for a bit more guidance on it um, I find that quite useful and it's available on the Claire website. Um, okay, that's really useful because somebody has asked whether it is, if scoring or weighting is purely subjective or if there is UK guidance. So if you yeah. mentioned, it's the only, only one. Yeah, the, yeah, the Claire, sorry, on Claire, they, they provide, um, there's a lot of uh, resources on there regarding this uh, method and there's a spreadsheet on there that's been developed by URS that can, mm -hmm that can sort of give you some guidance on how to carry it out. So it does have a sort of three tiered approach where it starts with qualitative, then it goes to semi quantitative and then it's a quantitative assessment. But yeah, there is good guidance on there. So it's definitely worth looking at. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, one other question we've got sim on a similar thread is early contractor engagement is key to delivering any cost and time effective remediation solution aside from technology. However, most clients don't rely solely on consultancy support. Would you agree that procurement is a more, rely is a more reliable route to securing sustainability in design? Or, or do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, think, I think early engagement of um, remediation contractors is, is definitely um, something that, you know, we, we should do. Um, especially because, you know, <laughs> they, they are the experts and they'll be able to tell you early on whether something is feasible or not. Um, so, yeah, I, I do. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that does. Yeah, that is something that, um, yeah, we should consider or clients should consider. Sure. OK. Um, a question around um, with the new LCRM soon to be adopted by all consultants. Would there be a necessity to provide some sort of guidance or directive with regards to the soil remediation technology and costs to aid the development of the stage two options, appraisals, reporting, or which can be the knowledge of key stakeholders? Oh, sorry, could you repeat that again? That's a quite a long question. Yeah, with the new LCRM soon to be adopted by all consultants, um, with regards to the soil remediation technology and cost to aid the development of the stage two options, which can, of appraisal reporting on which can benefit the knowledge of key stakeholders. Ooh, would, it um, <laughs> would it be necessary to provide some sort of guidance um, to this group? Um, yeah, I think it would be. Um, I'm not sort of, yeah, I'm not sort of that sort of clued up on it right now so I'm not really able to provide too much <laughs> um on that sure okay no that's absolutely fine um do you find that regulatory requirements put developers off from non-dig and dump remediation yeah I I I do sometimes um I mean I think it's from my experience it's always worth engaging with uh, regulators and um, early on um, I find yeah there is an element of sort of developers being being put off by um, going with any other options because I think you know they know that by doing dig and dump that essentially um, it's the most straightforward way of treating the problem and it is an accepted way of of dealing with contaminated land but um, I think if you were to engage with regulators early on, it's, it, I think that definitely helps. And from my experience, I'm, I'm pretty sure the regulators would appreciate it. And, you know, I think there is just an overall goal to be more sustainable. So I think it would, you know, if you were to engage with them early and explain what you, you know, hoping to achieve, I, I I don't, I'd like to think it does, it shouldn't put um, developers off, but yeah, I, I, from my experience, it does tend to be, they just want to get the problem resolved quickly. Um, so 
yeah they're just happy just to go down the dig and dump route to avoid oh. too much too much back and forth essentially um okay um do you are there any effective treatments for persistent organic contaminants of heavy metals and for heavy metals that you know of oh um i might have to pass on that sure. one um yeah sorry <laughs> no no that's absolutely fine um another thing is some research has shown that the efficiency of sorption absorption methods such as the use of activated carbon and biochar in soil remediation um, how soon do you think that this will be seen as a method in UK industry? Um, or do you think it would be at all? I, I think as there's a push to sort of be, become more sustainable um, in all your sort of remediation methodologies, I, I do think that it's, it's something that, you know, that, people will try and move away from the from the dig and dump method and adopt sort of more um, sustainable options like the one you just mentioned. And um, I think, um, yeah, I, I just think, yeah, I think we, were, we are, you know, from what I can tell, I think we are moving away from that and moving to more innovative methods. So I think it's all down to, you know, research and, um, sort of, you know, projects that have demonstrated that this is, that this works. And I think the more sort of research we have or the more case studies we have to demonstrate that these methods are, you know, are working, I think we, you know, we, we stand a better chance of, moving away from dig and dump and, and using um, methods like that to, to remediate. Okay, brilliant. Well, there was one question about a slide that you had up earlier on, mm -hmm. uh, where some of the data was quite quite small um, to read. Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> this, may, this, may, this question may refer back to that. So do you have some indicative figures on the amount of remediation that happens currently in the UK? Um, and if, if there's any kind of correlation with particular regions? Oh, I don't have any. No, I don't. <laughs> don't have, I think I, I think you were, it was probably the slide where I had the pie chart showing um, the amount of waste soils that are generated um, every year. I think that might have been the slide, but uh, I think if you look on, I think I got this information from um, DEFRA. There is a document. Um, I mean, I can send it to you later, Rihanna, if you want to share it. That okay. has quite good statistics there. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, also, one one question: Is there kind of a barrier around understanding with developers sometimes that they understand dig and dump? quite clearly, whereas anything more te technical may be perceived slightly more risky or um, unfamiliar. Is that, is that something that you overcome? Yeah, I mean, from my experience, I do sometimes think that there is a bit of a barrier and you do, you know, dig and dump is such a straightforward method um, and, and sort of effectively deals with the issue. I think there are times where you, if it gets a bit too technical or, you know, for example, with bioremediation, I mentioned there are times where you, you know, there are risks to it where, um, you know, contaminants may not sort of degrade completely and you only get partial degradation that could lead to metabolites that are sort of more mobile and migrate off site or, are actually more toxic. I think that aspect of it would make a developer more nervous. Whereas with dig and dump, you know, you, you're sort of guaranteed to essentially remove the, you know, re remove sort of the majority of the contamination. I think, yeah, I think it's all down to the risk. And with developers, they have such, you know, clients that I work for have such short build times in their programs that. Um, if you try and sort of suggest anything that's a bit more like sort of outside the realms of dig and dump, they do get a bit more nervous. So maybe it is a way, you know, maybe we as consultants need to try and 
um, educate them more or sort of find a way of explaining things a bit more straightforward and better for them. Because a lot of the time you, you kind of issue reports to clients and they don't really sort of read into the whole technical aspect of it and they just want like a straightforward answer. And yeah, I think there is definitely a barrier, um, barrier there. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, another one is there seems to be kind of a current focus around cost and time savings. However, mm. considering that topsoil resource is fairly finite, do you think the developers should place more emphasis on soil reuse as far as possible? Um, yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, I, I've, you know, I've worked with clients where they are trying to, you know, where you've got a site that might have a, a, a sort of a layer of topsoil on top and they are keen to, you know, to save on costs for importing, you know, clean topsoil, which is expensive. Um, you know, I, I have worked with clients that are keen to, you know, try and reuse the material on site. It benefits them because it saves on costs um so yeah yeah i think so um okay brilliant um and a, a question around um kind of the process really is are there any specific places or areas where we we as kind of professionals can remove the soil from and then transfer it to our field if you're in that situation so i i is that to do with sort of material the movement, movement like yeah. material i mean yeah there is you know you, you've got the sort of um you can have you know material um management plans if you've got material on a site that might not be deemed suitable for your site but can be used on another site there are ways that you can you know can put that in place you just need to you know do a materials management plan essentially and and make sure that you know all the appropriate sort of paperwork and exemptions if, if required are, are put in place but yeah there you know I've, I've worked on sites where the materials um, on the site isn't suitable for the site itself but if you want um, but then you know there's another site that would happily you know receive it and it is suitable for them then yeah that's definitely that's definitely something that should be considered Okay, thank you. And how do consultants generally keep up with scientific advancement related to soil remediation technologies? Is there a kind of a good site or is there areas? That um, I think it's just, I mean, um, from my own experience, I, I sort of attend a lot of, you know, there's a lot of sort of webinars out there on, on um, soil remediation. Um, various organisations do a lot of them um attending sort of conferences i think yeah it's just i mean it's all just part of your cpd i think just making time to to sort of sign up and attend um you know a lot of these webinars are free there are a lot of you know um companies uh that sort of you know, remediation companies that offer free webinars on various remediation technologies and i think that's a really good resource to use um, to just educate yourself and sort of help you you know consider these you know potential options for sites that you might be working on. Yeah definitely and I agree I think that currently as well there's a wealth of online CPD opportunities that the majority of which are free and yeah. So yeah, into those wherever, wherever you can and if you are IES members we try and do our best to circulate things that we come across and um, through various LinkedIn pages and on our website as well. So keeping abreast of those things as well. Um, a question kind of for, for you really, I think it's a bit of a curiosity about how you um, work, but at the start of a project, how do you decide which contaminants to look for considering you can't analyze for everything? Um, how do you prioritize? Um, well, I mean, looking at the, for me is looking at the site history, um, you know, if you've got a site that's, you know, 
that's just you know a field for example that's never really had much going on there you would generally go for a gen like a general suite which would comprise some you know heavy metals and hydrocarbons just to just to give you a general idea um and then obviously if you've got um like you know like a gas works you'd be looking to target contaminants associated with the gas work so you know cyanides um ammonium that's yeah so it's kind of just dependent on like phenols you know just dependent on site by site so it's always so important to look at the site history um and yeah and any other available information the client might have on a site so if, obviously if the phase one's been done previously that that would be a very useful resource in helping you determine um and it might be that you just target certain areas of the site for certain contaminants once you know you know if, for example if you have an electricity substation on a site you might want to test the um pcbs but you know you might not you know if you're sort of uh, restricted by budget you might just do a few samples <laughs> testing for that on certain parts of the site. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of targeting the right parts of the site. Um, I think that's the best way. Okay, thank you. And um, we are running out of time, but I just want to ask you one question. It's a slightly different approach. Mm -hmm. It's just recognizing that there's an increase of environmental awareness again around the general public and within the sector are feeling, feeling more pressure. Do you think that um, clients will start to focus on sustainability as more of a priority um i i think so yeah there's definitely been uh, in the last few years a, a massive increase in um people's interests in in the environment and the topic of sustainability and like i said mentioned in my last slide i you know talk about a lot of companies having corporate social responsibilities and you know sustainability is um a big part of that so i think i'd like to think that a lot of companies are sort of paying a bit more attention to that and and a lot of companies do have sustainability targets so yeah i'm hopeful that um you know moving forward um the sort of awareness will will make clients consider um more about sustainability than they have done previously yeah okay brilliant thank you that's all the questions that we've got time for and um, if there are others that are burning questions from attendees do contact me directly and i can always put them on to steph or or answer them so yeah just a huge thank you to steph for presenting today that was really interesting and for everybody who logged in and your questions and your contribution and we can record this as a cpd on the cpd tool if you're an ies member just log into the members area and you can do that if you've got any problems do contact the project office so this webinar has been recorded and it will be made available on the IES website and the YouTube channel. So do follow this and subscribe and you'll be notified every time a new webinar is added. The next webinar is going to be on the 30th of June on a very different subject, looking at gra seagrass restoration and bringing biodiversity back to the seas of the UK. And more information about that and how to register is on the IES website. Again, that is a free opportunity. For those um, professionals who did log in with a slight air quality interest, uh, we are hosting an, a one day conference online on the 22nd of June, which is looking at indoor air quality. <clears throat> and we've got speakers from BRE, Public Health England, WSP and several, several more. So details again on the IES and IAQM website for those who are interested. Um, but yeah, just a final thank you before we sign off to um, Steph and everybody who logged in and for your contribution. I hope you found that really useful. So thank you, Steph.